Hello and welcome to the Blues Focus podcast. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today, whether that be on YouTube, Spotify, Google or Apple Podcasts. To never miss any of the action, please check out bluesfocus.co.uk. You'll find all the links to our content on there. Uh, I'm Tom Oxlum from the Blues Focus podcast. I'm joined by fellow Blues Focus podcast member Tom Garrett to help provide some extra information today. And our special guest is former Blues loanee Rob Keenan. How are you, Rob? Thank you, guys. Yeah, there's some pleasure to be here. Thank you for your, uh, for your time as well. So, um, first for greetings from uh, sunny California. It's a little bit earlier than you guys, but we are on 12 minutes past 8 a.m., so a little bit behind uh, you guys. So, uh, nice one. Pleasure having you on, mate. So, I'll jump, I'll jump right into it, really. Um, so, obviously, you began your career in football at Watford and came through the academy there. I suppose, just how did you how did you get into football, firstly, and how did the opportunity to join the Watford Youth Setup come about? Um, listen, probably like every other young boy in, in the country, I was playing for uh, just a Sunday league team. Um, I got scouted at six years old, and at the time at Watford, there was only an under nines team. There wasn't anything younger than that, so um, started going training. Um, they signed me after probably about a week or so. I think it was. I think I did two sessions. Um, but big thanks to my dad actually because he was the one who pushed me in and he was very, very big on using both feet from an early age. So, you know, from as long as, as I can remember, it was all about doing, if I do it on my right, I've got to do it on my left. And, you know, he'd even take me up the park once and I'd only wear one boot. He'd be like, well, you're only using your left foot there. You know, just to drill it into me. So um, props go to him, mate, because I wouldn't be sitting here, you know, without him, if that's, that's a big fact. Um, so they went through the academy at Watford, uh, went through every age group, uh, signed professional at 15, got that contract under my belt, and then made my debut, I think, at about 17 with Brendan Rodgers against Crystal Palace. It was a cup game. I came on for probably six minutes at right back, and they scored after one minute of being on the pitch. So at that point, uh, the anxiety, <laughs> I, just, I didn't even want the ball, and uh, it was just see the game out. We ended up winning 4-3, and, uh, and that was that. Well, at least you won in the end. Um, no, that's yeah. a great story about your dad. I think, um, you know, it's always nice to hear stuff like that. I mean, I remember when uh, I was a young kid and my dad would take me out to because I always wanted to be a goalkeeper. So, mm. um, you know, he'd take me out and he's like, if you can dive on one side, you have to dive on the other sort of thing. So, no, no, I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, obviously, during your 11-year period at Watford, you had four different loan spells at Kilmarnock, mm. Yeovil, Bradford and uh, Wickham. I suppose out of those four loan spells, which one particularly helped kickstart your career and kind of settle you a bit? To be honest, boys, like, I was so young, I was never going to play in the first team and like every other boy, they get they, they playing all these reserve games, all that sort of stuff. It was, it was never going to do anything for your development and I'm, I'm very big on that and I believe that you need to go into an environment where you're getting challenged against, you know, men and being yeah. in a stadium environment as well. Um, so I used to knock on a gaffer's door every week. I said, listen, you know, let me go here, let me go here, let me go here. And at times I was just going places for a month. But I was just like, well, if I'm going to go and get three games or four games, like I've got four games, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I went to Kilmarnock as a skinny, I think I was about 17, 18 year old kid. And I was playing against, you know, big strikers like Kevin Kyle. And, you know, those boys were just swat me around like a little stick insect mate so actually it was a good good experience living in Scotland on my own or you know I left home at 16 years old and that was it I'd never return and um, it was just it was just a case of trying to get exposure to that first team environment and then I ended up made, I ended up playing against Celtic um, I ended up playing against Robbie Keane on his debut for Celtic and we actually won the game so I couldn't believe it um, the funny story there as well was that um, I was on the bench I come on for about half an hour I think it was at the end and um, I've only been training for a week I didn't know the players names I didn't know anyone mm. um, and uh, the gaffer called me over and said listen can you play right back I was like yeah 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 I can play right back I don't know. I've never played in my life <laughs> and, um, I, remember, I remember kind of against Marco Fortune who I later on played with at Wigan and I laughed about and um, after the game he was like yeah your positioning weren't great and I was like yeah I'll be honest gaffer I've never played in my life but I was just thinking to get on the pitch <laughs> <laughs> He ended up finding me. He found me like five hundred quid for lying to him. Flipping heck! <laughs> yeah, so, um, I think I think that's the that, that's the thing though. Sometimes, yeah, I think it's something we all wonder. And you know, you watch games and, and you see players, you know, asked to play in different because I mean, like someone like Jordan Anderson's been doing it at the minute, hasn't he, for Liverpool? Mm. And I always think, what's that like? You know, is that obviously you say there's something 
you know, that you jump straight the chance, whether it's, you know, if you have to play right back, you just play yeah, right back. To be honest, boys, like now, if you ask me to play right back, I'd think nah. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, when, you're, when you're just itching to get on the pitch and be a footballer and just experience, you know, that, that feeling, like you're going to do anything. But like boys like that at the top, mate, they're, they're so good, mate. They read the game so well. They've got so much knowledge. Yeah. And, and the thing is, as well, they've got good players around them. So it's not as if you're going to get exposed. Um, but listen, that's why they're the top boys. And, you know, I'm not. So that's, you know, simple. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, then, uh, obviously, in 2011, like you said, yeah, you eventually went to Wigan. Um, then further loan spells followed. Uh, but in 2014, you eventually broke into the Wigan first team after your loan at South End was cut short due to injuries at Wigan mm -hmm. and um, scored your first career league goal against Leicester. And you even featured in the playoff semi final against eventual winners QPR. I suppose mm -hmm. just what were those experiences like for you? Like, uh... you know what? South End was a great, great, great place for me at that point. Um, I, was at, I was actually living back home in, in the area that I was from. I was traveling in, but it was. It was it was nice to be back down south, and then um, I was just playing every week. Like I was just and like I was playing against like you know your Akin Fenwards and your, your big horrible centre forwards that were just like, well, this is you know completely alien to me. But what I, what did happen is that I learned how to do all that ugly stuff because I was I was deemed to be a you know a pretty centre back that was nice and comfortable on the ball, but you know can he do the ugly stuff? And I'll be honest with you, I couldn't do it at the start. Um, and then I had to go and just be horrible. Like, and they said to me, listen, don't worry about trying to play the ball out. Don't try worry about trying to take it down and do this and do that because you know I've, I've modelled myself on having a bit of composure I want it to be different I didn't want to be just head and kick it um, so I went and learned that kind of stuff and then I went back to Wigan and I ended up playing against Troy Deeney in my first game and against Watford and my old team and it was like I, I can actually do this like yeah Troy's a big big boy like he's a great great player like he was even better than so he's even better now than what he was obviously when I played against him but you know, he was not—he was not an easy pushover, and you know, I managed to just deal with that kind of ugly stuff, and then my kind of football stuff actually was easier because I was playing with better players and the ball was actually on the ground a bit, and you know, it actually helped me sort of really get that foundation at, at South End. Um, so yeah, I owe, I owe that to South End actually. As a, in terms of looking back now, it was, yeah, it was where I needed to be at the time. And uh, this is my advice to any young centre backs: just go and just go and play in those horrible games. Like just go and be horrible, and then let your his technique come out after and, and you know when you can when you go and do those horrible games the rest is actually a bit easier because it's actually football as opposed to head ball I call it in the, you know <laughs> yeah that's that's brilliant um, especially you know Troy big Blues fan as well um, I think many Blues fans including us two really have always wanted Troy to come and sign for us but I don't I don't think it'll ever happen but yeah no to to do that against your former club in your first game back that's that's brilliant. Like, um, I suppose just yeah. What was it like scoring your first professional goal? Um, yeah, it was amazing, mate. I remember it quite well actually. I remember <clears throat> Uwe Rosler. He, he he fancied me to be quite good in the air at, at age. I was I was, I was quite you know I, was, I wasn't really worried about it much. If I go and break my nose, I break my nose. I don't really care. Like I just wanted to play. So I was I was actually marking like Wes Morgan, who's a big boy as well. Anyway, I managed to just get in front of him and just nicked a little header. Um, I think it actually come off my head and then glance off my shoulder a little bit. So it kind of helped me. Yeah. Um, but mate, it was just a case of, look, I'm just going to go and attack the ball to see what happens. And then uh, luckily it, it goes in, mate. So um, it was a great feeling. My mum and dad were actually in the stadium as well. So like they'd never really got to see me much play, but it was just a random weekend. They had a bit of time off work and um, it was just... Good timing. <laughs> yeah, just one of those weekends, mate, where everything goes well, you know. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And then um, just you know, what was what was those the playoff semi final like? Um, that was an amazing experience because obviously then everyone's kind of taking note. Like you're in, you're playing against you played against QPR twice, and uh, I felt good at that age. I felt strong, fit. I was you know I was I was really enjoying my football. Um, I think obviously get through. James McLean went around the keeper, hit hit the post from like a yard out. I was fuming because um, <laughs> uh, the week before we actually were you know. The projector was up and we were, you know, on for like, you know, great team bonus. And we were talking about going here and there if we got promoted. And obviously as a young boy, I'm like, yeah, come on, let's let's have it. <laughs> um, so we go there. We, we, I can't remember the first game. I think, I think we made the first game. Or I can't remember. And then the second one. Um, but they had a good team. They had a good team. They had, you know, the likes yeah. of the Mora. They had Joey Barton playing the Crenshaw. Crenshaw sent me for a, sent me to the shop, mate, with a nice little Cruyff turn on the edge of the box. But he, he was silly. Anyway, he was silly. When he came to Rangers, he was silly. Um, 
but yeah, it was just a good feeling, man. It was just like I was playing. Um, it's funny because a funny story, funny story about that one is that we play QPR at Loftus Road, um, and we actually were just staying down the road. I think it was like in Brentford. I think it was just like a little hotel. Anyway, we were so late for the game, mate. There was so much traffic. So, yeah. um, as a young player, mate, I was just like, I used to, uh, I used to get cramp quite a lot because I, I think it was a nerve ball or anything. So I was like, I need to get a rub like, on my hamstrings and that because I'm going to get cramp. And uh, we didn't have any time. You know, I was just like, we didn't have, literally got off the bus. Literally, lad, you got five minutes. But I couldn't even get my ankle strapped or nothing. Flipping heck. <laughs> so I'm playing and that and like, I've got no cramp. Like, from that moment there, I'm like, oh, I don't need to get a rub now. So like, from then on, never got rubbed anymore because like, you know, it was all in my head. Um, so yeah, just funny little stories like that, mate. Like looking back, it's, it, was, it's, it was a great experience, mate. And QPR went on to, to do the magic. And, you know, I spoke to like Clint and... and uh, and Joey when they came up to Rangers and you know they remember those those days well and and actually Joey Barton mate that was the first encounter I had with him and he um he came into the change rooms after shook all our hands wished us all the best and I just thought from that day like it's just like top top boy you know like everyone's got that sort of persona around him but he's he is a top top boy proper like, professional yeah proper boy like proper real 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 winner you know like he's got that real attitude that it's just it's just I think you're born with it you know yeah definitely no, that's a great insight. I think I, I, when I when I watch sort of things like this, I like little snippets like that. Just they they're yeah. always very interesting. I don't know about you, Tom. I, I just yeah. I mean, as you were just saying about Jerry Barton, then I think it's something you often hear is the bad things you know he's done on uh, off the pitch. And you know, I think there's a few times probably where you know he hasn't helped himself. But I think you know it's things like that. It, it does make you wonder, doesn't it? You know, is it sometimes just the media how to get everyone because. As you say, then I think I've seen him in a few instances where I thought, you know, he seems like a good bloke. I think I've seen him on soccer a few times and that. And yeah. I think, you know, I think, again, we all know that what the media tends to do to players nowadays, don't we? Yeah. yeah I think it's taken from, from being a little bit of spotlight throughout my career, mate. And especially up in Scotland, it was really exposed. Like, it's, yeah. it's a different media up there. It's completely different. It's not the same tabloids. But listen, yeah. when you know when you know someone and you get to know someone and you work with someone every day, like, listen, he's a, he's a top, top boy, top boy. I suppose just on that media subject quickly, um, I, I read into your career at Rangers and I know you got a lot of stick for the Scottish Cup final. Mm. Um, I suppose, what was it like dealing with the media after that? Cause... Well, to be honest with you, boys, like, as soon as I went up to Rangers, uh, I, I, had, I, hadn't even, I hadn't even put on a shirt yet and I was getting death threats from you know, the RA and I'll get his near and that. Because my family's Catholic, so I'm Irish. My dad's Irish, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I have a... I have a Virgin Mary tattooed on my arm because of my, my nan who passed away that was on her bedside table. So things like that, you know, it's, it's that's my heritage. That's my I can't I can't do anything about that. That's the way I was born. You know, I played for Ireland up to under twenty ones, and then when I stepped into the country of Scotland and playing for the the wrong team on paper, you know, I was already up against it. You know, and I was yeah. um, I got burgled twice. You know, I was getting in scraps and that outside the clubs because just because of my name really. Um, so I was always up against the uphill battle and I didn't really realise the magnitude of that when I when I stepped in um, and then listen yeah I, I took stick um, you know we played a, we played an expansive style of football under Mark Warburton um, and anyone that's seen Mark's style it's you know I love it I'm not sitting in and sort of making excuses I love that but you know we're a team that was if we're going to concede three well we'll score four you know that was the kind of mindset yeah and at times boys you get you get you get um, you get exposure centre back and that's that's facts Um Listen, I made mistakes. Of course, I did. Everyone makes mistakes, but um, you know, obviously, when those mistakes happen, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was an easy target, I suppose, for me because it was, you know, I'm already, you know, the black sheep, if you like, out of the, out of the herd, and um, you know, I'm a centre back. You know, you make mistakes. You often can see goals as a keeper as well. So yeah, listen, I took stick. Um, there were great times at Rangers. I enjoyed it. I loved it, and there was amazing fans and there was amazing people around me. But obviously, you get, you know, people with. The a, bit more, a bit more of an agenda as well. Like, you know, yeah. listen, listen, my heritage is what my heritage is. You know, I'm proud to be Irish. I'm proud, I'm proud of that. So it's not, I'm never going to, you know, shy away from that. Do you kind of learn how to, you know, sort of block that out when you go onto the pitch there? I mean, and obviously, you know, you said then we've getting uh, burgled and stuff like that. I mean, that, that's got to play a, you know, like a part of when you go into yeah, training or on the match days. Yeah, there, was, there was times where it's like, it's difficult because, you know, like you, you and, and this is the one thing I say to the young boys now, stay away from all your phones and all the, all the Twitter and all that bullshit because yeah. everyone's an expert, everyone's got their opinion, but listen, they don't see the real stuff. They don't know what's yeah. going on behind the scenes. They don't know, 
you know, when your house is getting burgled and you're, you know, up at 4 a.m. in the morning and you've got a game in front of 55,000, it's, it's, it's not as easy as everyone thinks. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like you're checking your shoulder sometimes as well because you think, you know, I've been out and I've been out and having dinners and nightclubs and whatever else. And, you know, I've, you know, I'm getting into stuff with boys and that. I don't even know yeah. them, you know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not, I'm not a pushover, but I'm not saying that I'm, you know, Conor McGregor in any sort. But, you know, no one's going to give me a stick and just stand there and take it, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I'm, a, yeah. I'm a boy just like everyone else. Like, yeah. It is what it is, you know? Yeah, no, I, it's horrible that sometimes in football those things happen because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's a game. It should never be more than a game. Um, but uh, the, fact, the fact that you have to look over your shoulder like that, I suppose, must be horrible. I uh, mm. couldn't do that. And I suppose... Is some of the rivalries up in Scotland are still quite old fashioned. Massively. You've got to remember as well, boys, that Glasgow's just, there's two teams in Glasgow. And this is no disrespect to anyone in Scotland, but like football is the be all and end all. Like there's not really much yeah. else on offer there. Yeah. Um, say, for example, you move to London, there's so much going on in London. It's like, you know, even if you saw Ozo walking down the street, like, yeah, he might get a bit yeah. of, you know, but it's like there's, there's musicians, there's artists, there's, you know, there's actors. It's, it's London's just a whole different city, whereas Scotland's and Glasgow itself is very football focused, and it's like a bubble. It's got no media. It's got Celtic yeah. Rangers, and that's it. So it's a completely different um, environment to be in. Um, and if you're not from there, man, if you don't really know it, it's, it's a bit of a shock at times. You know, like it's you know when it's going well, it's amazing. You know, when we got promoted and we won this, won, you know, won that, like it was great. You know, you're going out for dinners and. You know, restaurant owners are taking care of it, or you know, doing this and doing that. You're deemed to be, you know, we beat Celtic after like four years or whatever, and you're, you know, people are coming up for pictures and doing da, da, da and then you lose next week, and you're, you know, you're an Irish scumbag. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna, you know, do this, do that. You know, like it's just like, you know, I've got to take it with a pinch of salt, but at the same time, it's like you you don't get this in any other job, you know, and, and yeah. you can't really get prepared for that. Um, so do, listen, you find that, do you find that something easier as you get older as well, though? Yeah, yeah. Now, like, yeah, listen, now, boys, if I was there, it was just, it's just whatever. Do you know what I mean? But <laughs> yeah. when you're like, when you're that so engulfed in it and you can't really see anything other than that, like, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Definitely a, a fair play to you for being that headstrong. I don't, I don't, if, if I was a professional, no, I'd be quite good. <laughs> it's so, just like, um, imagine you going to work, for example, like, Tom, like you're a barber, is that correct? You're a barber, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine every haircut you do, you, every haircut you get is in the media. It's being scrutinised, or someone's got an opinion. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, mate, I every couldn't, I, I couldn't deal with yeah. it. Not boys waiting outside your, or your barber shop trying to fucking, yeah, yeah. or trying to rob your yeah. house, or trying to yeah. scratch your car, or you know what I mean? Like, I'll be honest, mate. You know what I mean? I, I wouldn't, if that was the case, I wouldn't even get to work. It's like you say, <laughs> for me, I think I'd just roll over and that'd be it. We'll do some uh, uh, haircuts from home or something. <laughs> Yeah, that's no, that's fair. That's mental, to be honest. Um, I know. But um, yeah, obviously, after your time at uh, well, I suppose late on towards your time at Wigan, and uh, after that uh, playoff season, you uh, second half of the season after you had your loan move to Blues. Yeah, um, I suppose. Yeah. Just how, how did that move come about? Yeah, so we had a new manager, Malcolm McCarr, who had at Watford, and we didn't really get on too much. Um, I wasn't really the style of player. Like I said earlier, I, I kind of wanted to be the Sent it back that could play on the ball a little bit, and he just didn't want that at all. And I said, Listen, Lamalki, like, this, I'd love to go and play. Like, I've been playing every game for Wigan. Obviously, you've come in, you know, I'm not your player. That's cool. And then um, there was loads of trouble with it because you know, Wigan at the time was struggling. And I went, I went then to go to Birmingham. We ended up in this like 10th in the table, and Wigan was struggling that week. So it was all a bit of a nightmare. Um, at the time, my friend Callum Manaman just signed for West Brom. So we were actually living in an apartment together. Oh, the club actually got me an apartment, no, um, yeah. but me and Kyle, you know, ended up just meeting up, and uh, our friend Wardy moved in as well. We were a little, uh, little trio in Birmingham, mate. Um, it was a great, <laughs> it was a great time. But um, but I loved the Blues. I absolutely loved the Blues. The setup was great. The training ground was great. The boys were good as gold. I loved Gary Rowett. I had him at Burton, and the style of play was just sitting and we'll count on them. And it for me, it was like I'm not getting exposed. So as opposed to Rangers, where you're getting exposed, Gary's a completely different. Like he plays like Leicester do, you know, when they sit in. They're sitting yeah. and making it off. You know, I had Morrison next to me. He was a, he was a great player, mate, great leader. Um, we just sat in. We were hard to beat. And then we had, like, Damari and we had Cottrell. And we had Donaldson. They were just going to run ragged. You know, so it was a good team. Um, and I felt like I did add something to that team at the time. You know, I was, I was playing well. Um, I loved it. Um, at the time, they offered me a contract to go and sign for the next season. 
Um, so this is how it went down. I uh, I had a phone call in Vegas. I was in Vegas for my holiday. My friends stag doing that, and um, Mark Warburton rang me. He was like, "Listen, um, I know you, you know you're keen on going to sign for Birmingham, but I'm getting the Rangers job. I'd love you to come." Um, I didn't really think much of it, and there was nothing, no talks of it. I was like, "Oh yeah, good one." Like, you know, it's what it is. I need to look after myself. To be honest, I'm not waiting. So I got back from holiday, done all the medicals at Birmingham, went up to the Spire Hospital, wherever it was, done all the MRIs and the heart scan, you name it, done it. And um, went back, we're going to sign the next day. And then the, as the next, that morning, it got announced that Mark Warburton got the job. So I'm on the way to go and sign for Birmingham. Like, I'm in the car. And he calls me and he's like, listen, I've got the job. Like, I want you to be my first signing. And I was like, fucking hell, I'm 30 minutes away from the train <laughs> Like my, I've already like you know I've already looking at a house that I was about to rent in Birmingham and like, I've shut myself up and uh, I was in the I was in the car with an old man and he just said he said like, what do you want to do I said I said I love Birmingham like I'm seeing the championship I'm playing I know I will play you know it's close to home but you know Rangers is a massive club Dad like I might yeah. never get a chance to play for that sort of club again um, and I just I just had to sit down we sat in the service station for like 20 minutes like literally had to make a decision in 20 minutes. Um, I just thought the, the potential of going to that club and, and, you know, playing in front of that stadium and, like, the history behind it, mate, I just I had to go. And, obviously, Mike Warburton had me at Watford. I mean, I've known him for 20 years, whatever it might be now. So, I, I made that decision. Um, I, rang, I I spoke to uh, the club and I said, listen, guys, uh, Birmingham, this is us. I spoke to Gary and I said, listen, you know, all due respect, like, thank you so much for everything you've offered me. Um, but I've got an opportunity and I just want to go and take it. You know, it's going to be a big challenge. And looking back now... People ask me, what do you think you should have done? And I said, I could look at both ways. I could have gone played for Birmingham. I could have gone done well. I could have got another championship move and, you know, you know, whatever, or got, you know, into a team that, you know, maybe got promoted. I don't know, whatever it could have been. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Or I go to Rangers and, you know, things went well, things didn't go so well. You know, but I think looking back on it, I think it was the right decision at the time um, because I believed in myself. Um, and it was an amazing experience going there. Um, but Birmingham was, was an incredible place as well. Don't get me wrong. Like, I loved it. Like, Got nothing but respect for them. Um, loved the, loved them, loved the team, loved the boys, loved the manager at the time. I really like Gary. Like I think he's a great manager. Gets a lot out of his players. Um, it's just I got the opportunity, boys, and it was like it's it's kind of like once in a lifetime. You know, you go, go for it, or do you you know go somewhere where you know yeah. you're going to play and be loved. But you know, I went for it. I just you know it was a decision I made, and I, I had to go for it. You know. Oh, yeah. hindsight, I think any way, you know, you, like you say, you just don't know, do you? you could look at it one way and think this could happen, look at it another way. And I think, you know, with what you just said, I think I'd probably be the same looking back now. You know, you've got a chance to go to Rangers, like you say, massive club, massive history. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I'd, you know, looking back on your career, it'd be nice to say you, you'd have done that rather than just staying here, I think, wouldn't it? So, I, you know, don't, don't blame you at all. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think... Uh... From my point of view, if I wasn't a Blues fan and I was in your position, I'd have probably done the same thing because, you know, <laughs> essentially you could be a part of a, a big club that's on the rebuild and you could be a part of that rebuild. And uh, Yeah, and, and it was great. Like the first season, you know, we got promoted, I think, within about six weeks prior to the season, you know, one cup. Yeah. Then we played, we beat, we beat uh, Selwick in the first time in like four years. Um and it was a great experience. Don't get me wrong; like it was an amazing experience. But um, it was just like there's a lot that goes with it, um, as well as just playing football. You know, it's like there is yeah, a lot that goes on. And, and I don't think people down in the UK really grasp that unless you're up there in that environment. And the English boys will tell you that they've gone up there; they'll tell you the same thing. Like it's a lot more intense than what people think. And you, you know, you're constantly getting scrutinised constantly. Yeah, I, I was got. I suppose you can say um, that move to Rangers must have done a lot for your mental health and obviously you've taken it the right way and become stronger, I suppose, after it. Uh, Tom, aside from this, does a mental health podcast. Uh, so, you know, he's, he looks into a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, but no, that, the fact that you've come out, I suppose, stronger after that experience must be helpful just for... Yeah, no, and listen, you've got to remember, like, you've got to remember, like, my mum and dad come up to the first um, uh, old firm at Celtics, at Celtics place and... Um, you know, there's boys getting stabbed outside the ground. There's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a dummy that's being hung um, from the terraces, and there's like, it's just madness that's going on. Like, there's literally like, you know, we're getting off the bus, and you know, they're, they're pelting, spitting at you, and like throwing chewing gum at you, and like, it's, it is mad, it is mad, and 
the intensity of that roar when you walk out to that old firm, mate, is like something you've never seen before. Like you can't, you can't hear your centre back partner. Like I'm, you know, shouting, you know, directing, you know, organising that, and like people can't hear you, and they're not ignoring you. It's just like sixty thousand screaming, you know, it's constant. You know? So like, yeah, the build up to it, you know, we getting police ex- police escorted to the games. Like it's just, it's just a different world up there, man. Like, and people don't really recognise it and, and don't see it and. Scottish football doesn't get as much recognition as it probably does because it's a lot, it's a lot. You've got to remember, when you play for Southwark Rangers, it's everyone's cup final. Like, they want to beat you because like, it's their chance to impress them, potential scouts or whoever it is. Like, if I can do well against Rangers, then great. So people park the bus. So Rangers are expected to go and beat these teams 4, 5, 6, 0. You know, that's literally what the fans expect. Yeah. But, you know, it's like you put, put 11 boys behind the team. Uh, sorry, 11 boys behind the ball. Like, it's tough. You've got to have boys that do magic to go and score a goal. Now, we're trying to just penetrate, penetrate, penetrate. Boys get tired after six, seven minutes. We get countered. We're so exposed. And these teams are literally drilling themselves all week to sit in, sit in, sit in, try and nick a set piece, try and nick a counter. You know, so like, you've got to remember, you're not playing like a normal game as well with all the pressure of the fans. These teams that are just sitting in the park in the bus trying to get that, you know, one little bit of a mistake or exposure. It's, it's it's not as easy as what people think. I'm telling you, like it's not as easy. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, obviously, you look at Celtic at the moment; they're on an awful run. Um, yeah, lost to Saint Mirren, I think, the other day. Um, it's it's little teams like that. I can imagine that you get the most stick over, kind of Saint Mirren, yeah. Hamilton, Ross County, because <clears throat> the the club size, you know, between Celtic and Rangers compared to the rest of the league, really. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like Premier, it's Premier League versus like League Two, League One. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Literally. Is that um, so? Yeah, there's a big, there's a big gap, mate. There's, there's a big gap. Yeah, that's that's mental. I suppose I was going to ask you like, what was it to like to play under Gary Rowett? But I suppose you've already. Really oh yeah, top, top, that. top, top boy. I had him, I had him at Burton, and he was brilliant for me. I like his style. It's easier as a centre back to play those condensed formations where you're just sitting in, and your midfielders do a lot of work for you. So it's good for me. Yeah. Um, but listen, I love I loved him. Like, I think he's a great manager. I like the way he speaks. I like his respect levels that he's got to his players. He treats people like normal humans. And it's big, it's a big thing. Yeah. I, I suppose um obviously on your time at Blues, I'd I'd probably say your best moment has to be um scoring the equaliser against Wolves in the two one Derby Day victory. I suppose yeah. what was that atmosphere like and what was scoring that goal like for you? Yeah, it was listen, I think I, I think it was a corner. I think it was a bit scruffy, wasn't it? I just managed to yeah. nip it in. Um, it I, actually scored, I, actually scored, I actually scored against Derby, right? And um it came it wasn't counted to me. It was actually Donaldson, but it actually came off my head so I was fuming I didn't get that one. Um, <laughs> as a as a as a striker I think he gave me like hundred quid said so, listen make sure you say it I was like all right. Um, <laughs> But no, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, listen, it was my first taste of that sort of derby atmosphere. But boys, like, I can't, and this is no disrespect to, to, to Birmingham or Wolves, but like, mm. that's a rivalry, yeah. But like, it's Rangers Celtic <laughs> times, times 100,000 or whatever. Yeah, it's a better rivalry. I, I'm actually at the minute, guys, I'm filing for my green card, right? And what, what happens is you have to create, you know, like a file for kind of what you've been through in your career. And, you know, and I was just doing a bit of research, and that, that old firm game had 100 million views, you know, so like, heck. 100 million views, you think how many people that is, you know? Yeah, it's a lot of people. Right, I mean, it's crazy. It's a worldwide game, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, listen, it was an amazing game, don't get me wrong, and to score was great. Um, but it's just, I just to try and really try and put it in comparison. Yeah. Like, up there, uh, it's, it's just a different world, man. It's a different world. I mean, at, the, at that time, we were only really kind of, the club was only kind of kick-starting again. I don't know if you remember, Tom. But yeah, like, no, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'd, yeah, we'd come out of such a rough couple of years and a lot of fans had kind of come and gone. Um, but this, it, under Gary, we're starting to bring the fans slowly back in. You know, numbers were going up, atmospheres were getting better. But it's, it's a shame. I mean, if you did stay at Blues, you know, that next season we did play Villa away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. playing, honestly, the difference between when we play Wolves or West Brom compared to when we play Villa, it's yeah, yeah. the difference. Is yeah, no, I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's not it's still not quite old firm, but it, it's brutal. I mean, you probably saw what happened to Jack Grealish last time. Yeah, we played. Sure, man. He's running on, punching him up and that, yeah. Yeah, that was... 
mental. I mean, the club. The thing, like, it's the thing that you don't get that. Like, listen, no one comes into your barber shop and punches you, then just you know, like. Nah, nah, no, no. Nah. You got to remember, this is like you know, we're humans. Like, we are humans. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. and for me, like, someone punches me, I'm scrapping. Like, it's, it is what it is. Like, it's a man v man right now. Like, it's not footballer and a, a normal person. And this is what people got to understand as well. Like. Yes, we are footballers, and yes, like we are supposed to act in a certain way, but like, at the end of the day, I'm a man. Like, you're a man. Like, I'm not going to come up to you and punch you and expect us to get away with it. Like, if you punch me, I'm going to punch you up. Like, it's, it's simple. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's not like I'm oh I'm a footballer, I can't do that. Like, it's it's men versus men, and yes, like we have to act a certain way, but we are humans. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And I'd I'd be the same if I was a footballer. You 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 wouldn't stand there or just just take it because it is it's not on. Um, well, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, it sort of links in with, you know, at the minute I was reading yesterday about was it Rashford again and uh, there was another, sorry, I can't remember who the other player was. And, 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 you know, I, so, sorry, mate, what did you say? I think it was. Yeah, that was it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I just think, you know, like, we you know, we keep putting all these adverts on and stuff like that. And, you know, it's great. But, you know, what, what what's it doing? Because it's still happening. And I think, you know, as you said, I think for the well-being of people and, and, and the future, you know, the future generation, I think, you know, this... These people have just got to be, you know, single. I know they are starting to get singled out, but you know, I, I personally think more's got to be done to it. You know, just keyboard warriors. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think I think I've seen something on my friends Marvin Sordo. He does a lot in the in the PFA and stuff. I think they've just issued like fines to Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff, all their social media platforms. If they're because they're now going to be held responsible. So yeah, I don't yeah. know how it's going to work, but they need yeah. Listen, it's, at least it's a start. At least it's something that's you know being implemented. And like I said, listen, it's. It's just, there's just no words for it, mate. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it is it, unfortunately, like, not that we've accepted that like, you're going to get stick in, in, your, in our job role, but it's like, it's just part and parcel of it now. Like, and unfortunately, yeah. for the dads, dads are getting racially, you know, discriminated against and, and racially abused, mate. It's, it's not, I, I just can't get my head around it. You know, I still can't yeah. get my head around it, but, you know, at least there's, at least there's something now that's put in, put in place for them, you know, and I hope it, I hope it just, you know, carries on and I hope they'll get looked after better, you know. Definitely, yeah. Um, I suppose moving on from that and just lastly touching on Blues, uh, which player stood out for you while you took oh, Damari Gray, mate. Damari Gray was silky, yeah. mate. Plus, <laughs> I remember doing one-on-one stuff with him and I was thinking, God, he's going to put me into the ground. <laughs> but uh, I said to the boy, I said to the boys, like a few of the older lads in that, like in different clubs, and that, I said, listen, there's a player here, man. He's going to be a player. I said, he runs like Ronaldo. Like he runs and moves. Like, I don't know if you boys yeah. have this. But the way he moves and step overs and even that like top top, top knuckle ball strike he's got, yeah, like he's got some mad technique and he's like honestly, I, I, he's silky man, he's silky. I just seen he's gone somewhere, huh? Is he, is he gonna? Oh, Leverkusen. Oh, yeah, okay. I seen that yesterday. Surprised me to be honest. I thought I thought he would have stayed in England, but it's like you say, I think as you said before, you know, a lot of these younger players now they just want to be playing football, don't they? Wherever it is, yeah. and a, a lot are going over to Germany. To be fair, aren't they? Yeah, he is a he was a crazy talent, mate. He was a crazy talent. I think we get a 20% sell on from that, but I doubt it'll be much. Yeah. <laughs> um, helps, mate. All helps. Yeah, definitely, definitely, especially at this time anyway. Um, I suppose one one other question on Blues, actually. Who who would you say was your best mate in the changing room, just always at the club in general? Um, well, it was weird because Paul Robinson's actually from Watford and I'm from Watford, so we got on really well. And he obviously he was a you know sort of father figure in that in that changing room. He was top bloke. Like, yeah, top bloke, mate. Um David Davis was a good lad. He, he looked after me a little bit. With just a few little, you know, things around the city and stuff. Um, uh, Mick Morrison was a nice lad. Yeah, really good. Really good professional. Um, the big the big guy, what was the big guy? The big striker, what was his name? I can't remember. Ziggich. Yeah, Ziggich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was a character, mate. He was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I listened, listen, lads. They were all top boys. And uh, I played with Clayton at um, Brentford as well. So he was a nice face to have around. Um, it's, just, it's a good change room, mate. Good change room. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Oh, everybody loves uh, Big Zig, really. Uh, you won't yeah. find many blue yeah, fans yeah. don't like uh, Zig. <laughs> but obviously, um, I mean, we just done a podcast with former Blues manager Lee Clark. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, and he, he spoke about uh, how much of a character Zig was. And, like, you know, he'd, he'd always brag about how much he was earning, but do it in the nicest way possible. And, like, <laughs> uh, he'd, he'd buy people beers all the time and whatnot. He just, yeah, he sounds like a quality guy, and uh, obviously he's. Lovely. You need, you need the mini characters, mate. 
to be honest with you, because of the media and, and the way the world is now, you can't have a personality. And it like the game, the game's like full of robots, man. Like it's like you got you got to have opinions and that. Like everyone just screws knows you. So like boys have a lot of opinions and stuff, but we just don't we just don't bother putting it out there anymore. Like it's just like we keep it between ourselves and like because you no, know, listen, I'm I'm actually I would like just for example like Pogba. Like, listen, I'm I'm not a fan of him doing dances and all that stuff and like you know. But like at the end of the day, he's a he's a he's a human. Like let him have his little bit of a character. Like let him let him do what he wants to do. Like, let him have a personality. Yeah. You know, like and then oh, he's not doing well because he's too busy doing TikTok dances or whatever he's doing. But like that's his that's his personality. Like it, you know, there's timing for it in my opinion. Like don't be putting it on on Instagram before a game, all that kind of stuff. But like mm. just a character in general, mate. Like it's just seems to like you've got to be a footballer. And that's it. You can't do anything outside of football. You know why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know. And in the, the day, like you can't put us in a box, man. Would you like you know? Yeah. You, you know. Yeah, no, I, I get that completely. Um, obviously, there, there's right and wrong times to do things. I think the biggest example of stuff like that is probably Paul Pogba these days for criticism on that sort of level because, you know, you could post something on social media and it could be before a game and you'd hear right, it. Well, let me tell you this then. Yeah, let me tell you this. So I went out for dinner after beating Hibs like three weeks prior to playing another game. The Scottish uh, media published a picture of uh, or a report of me and Wares and whoever it was. We went for dinner didn't even go out, I had a drink at the bar and I sit, you know, like literally in bed for like half 10, 11. They published it three weeks later after we lost. Rangers boys out night before game. Like, That's you know, mental. Just bullshit, man. It's just bullshit. bullshit. Do anything for the story though, won't they? So, um, no, it's, it's a shame that that's, that's the world we live in, really. Um, but yeah, no, obviously, is, like, yeah. we've, like we've touched upon uh, quite a lot already, you know, after Blues, you went on to Rangers, um, just I, obviously, I think looking at it, you've probably made most of your career appearances at Rangers. Um, so I suppose yeah, it yeah. probably, despite some experience, ranks highly in uh, in your regard, especially in your career. So just uh, I suppose what was lot like, like the time. Yeah, listen, it was, listen, looking for it now, and even even now, like even being here in America, like when you people sort of ask you know where your career been and where is it you know where is it where's your most enjoyable times, and actually the club that I'm at now, Orange County Soccer Club, it's um got a partnership with Rangers now so we having like we have staff come over we have loan players from Rangers come in so it's a good partnership they've got and you know being a part of that club it just it, it's an amazing memory and it's an amazing experience and I didn't really realise how much big of a club it is when you're there it's, it's even now like you know even people just you know, have a chat like how much time at Rangers and that these are no, no not being cringy but I don't know these people they're just kind of people that kind of seen what you've done and if you're affiliated to that club it's like you know it's like nobody will talk about it you know and it's great it's great to be a to be a memory and it was it was just like I said it was an experience it was an experience not just in football but in life and um, you know now I've got I've actually got a young player here he's actually going over to Rangers and um, he's signing for them and I just said to him like I can't prepare you for this but I'm going to tell you everything and try and guide you and try and help you because I can't really give you the magnitude until you're there but I'm trying to help him and just give him a head start you know I suppose you need to, especially with what you've been through. I don't think there's there's many out there better to hear from, really. Um, yeah. from my point of the view, the horse's mouth, isn't there, you know? Yeah. So um, no, I, I wish all the best to what's that. It, what's it? Um, what's it like over? What What's it like over there then? In in you know playing in America. I know you play in the is it the US. Are you playing? Yeah. So we're not the MLS. Yeah. We're not that. So um, the issue yeah. in the MLS guys is that there's three foreign spots, right? So yeah. imagine you got. Three foreign spots, um, and ultimately they want to go for the big names, big strikers, really. You know, if you look at your Zlatans and, you know... Yeah, yeah. Rooney, so, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. those boys obviously have weight. So for me to go, I would my, my dream was to go and play in the MLS. I thought, you know, I think, you know, I, I could play in the MLS uh, quite comfortably, but they don't really want a centre-back, mate. It's not really in their, in their, yeah. in their interest. So the USL um, is, a, is a great league. It's growing. It's probably the equivalent of probably League Two to League One. Uh, in terms yeah. of um, the player calibre yeah. um, and there's some really good young talent like you've seen there's loads of Americans now over in Europe and they're doing really well so you can yeah. the market here is actually you know it's rife um, so the, the the hardest thing though is the, is the heat so you'll go to Texas yeah. you'll go to um, Vegas there's no air and it's like 110 uh, Fahrenheit which is what I don't know like ridiculous 40 or whatever it is so like imagine playing yeah. with no air in that heat and it's like Guys, I can't even breathe, well, let alone run. I, I, rem- I remember going over, I think I went over in uh, Washington, D.C. last year. It was in August, and it, I think it was about the same. You know, it's about equivalent of about 42, 43 degrees. And, you know, you walk outside 
and all you want to do is walk back inside. You just want to be in the air con, huh? <laughs> it's like, if you could play in, indoors with air con, you'd probably be all right, wouldn't you? Yeah, so that's the thing you've got to remember as well. Like, so for us, foreign boys coming over, it takes a little while to climatise. Um, now I think yeah. I'm fine, like, it's cool now, but yeah, it's, it's different. Uh, the level of football, um, the boys, it's not like League One and Two where boys are just crashing it. It's, it's actually, everyone tries to play. Everyone's trying to play out and, and play the right way. Um, so it's actually quite nice. Um, yeah. Style of football. Um, it's just the weather's hard, man. And, and like you've got to remember as well, like I'll travel somewhere that's like three hours ahead. So like I'll get off the plane, it might be like my body clock says it's six o'clock in the afternoon or six pm. Yeah. It's actually nine. You know what I mean? So like, and you wake up, you got to wake up three hours earlier than what you. You know what I mean? So like, there's time yeah, burn, yeah. there's heat. You know, it's just it's just different. It's just tough. Yeah, it's just different. Yeah. In terms of like, you know, like when you say you was at Rangers though and you was having like, you know, a lot of people, you know, noticing you and stuff. Have you found it easier being over there yeah, yeah, in that sense? That Definitely. Yeah. You've got to remember soccer's like it's growing, don't Four, it's fifth, growing, yeah. but it's like you go, you know, you've got your you know, your, your top boys are your NFL boys, uh, your basketball yeah. players, your ice hockeys. Um, you know, soccer's soccer's growing, mate. It is growing, but it's not it's nowhere near the level. And yeah, you don't get that public eye. Yeah, it's which is nice. I I I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. A bit more calm, chilled. Uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, you see big players like Frank Lampard, Steven Gerrard, even Zlatan, but Zlatan's decided to continue, obviously. But, you know, they, they go to the MLS as these big signings just to kind of see out that kind of last period of their career because mm. it's just a bit calmer and you can enjoy the game a bit more. I think um, that's how I see it. From, uh, yeah, for sure. Team. Listen, and, and obviously those boys, they, they, you know, they're incredible talents, and they're, that's why they're the best in the world. But don't get me wrong; it's not like, from what I've kind of gathered and what I've kind of feel, feel like, I think that the MLS aren't here for just to be a retirement home. Like, it's not that yeah. anymore. Like, I think, I think uh, those kind of days are gone. It's not that anymore because uh, these boys are fit and strong, and they're athletes. I'm telling you, they are. Athletes. It's like um, I, I remember watching um, Jack Harrison play for. NYCFC, you know, in a friendly, I think it was when I was in New York. And, you know, I never, now. I'll be honest, I'd never ever would I have thought he would be playing in the Premier League. You know, I think that was when he was about 18, 19. But, you know, you think that the leaps and, I mean, obviously when Lampard went over there, it probably helped him out a lot. Players like that, uh, Perlo, you know, that, that type of player. But, you know, you look at where he's now and what he's doing for Leeds. And I think what you've just said proves that, doesn't it? It's not just a league now where you go at the end of your career. No, it's, it's not, honestly, boys, it's not. And, you know, I've got people belling up my phone every week, like, oh, can you get down here, can you get down here? I'm like, listen, boys, like, even in my league, there's foreign spots and, you know, they're trying to convert a conveyor belt of players as well to take to Europe. Yeah. So, like, you know, it's, I'm telling you, there's good players here, I'm telling you. They just need to be in that in professional environment, like, uh, you know, where they're getting the best of the best training and, and, and yeah. you know, like, we train every day, we train every day, you know, we've got good facilities, we've got, you know, gyms, all that kind of stuff. Um, so like we it's it's not far off, I'm telling you, it's not far off. Yeah, yeah and obviously nowadays <clears throat> you in particular you see a lot of scholarships in, for America and USL teams, all sorts. So I there there's a clear agenda there to try and breed talent yeah. over there. And obviously yeah. with the whole three foreign player things, they're trying to produce homegrown talent, which I think yeah. is really impressive and obviously yeah. it is getting so more kind of just kind of just touches on to where I'm at at the minute guys so I've, I've got an academy here um, and I uh, I have a very good cluster of players and I've, I'm sending one to, to Denmark on trial um, so I do a bit we do a bit of work for, for European clubs as well so if there's players here that we like the look of and think potentially they might have a bit of a chance then you know we can do that conveyor belt um, so yeah it's, it's like I said like I'm, I'm, I'm in the thick of it I'm playing and I'm sort of doing the other side of it as well so I'm, I'm sort of seeing it you know from both angles and, and there's, there's talent trust me there is talent yeah how must that feel like bringing young players through that I suppose you feel responsible for like they, you must feel yeah. Like proud it's, really yeah I mean so we work closely with them so we have our academy training here we have you know very very good coaches that you know work privately with these players as well as you know small groups and ultimately, it's our reputation as well. So I can't send someone over there that I don't feel is adequate because ultimately no, that, that lets me, makes me down. Um, but we see them first time. We see them in the flesh and we know, like, you know, I can see if someone's got, you know, that ability or that, you know, even and even just the mindset. The mindset's the biggest thing for me. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's great and I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, obviously, my focus is playing and, and doing that. But alongside it, you know, like every footballer, you have a lot of hours in the day to do stuff. You know, everyone yeah. thinks you should just be a footballer and do this and that. But, you know, like, you finish training at 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock. 
you know, I've, you know, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm interested in it. I'm, I want to learn. I want to develop. I want to grow as a person. I want to, you know, create something alongside just playing. So that's what I'm kind of doing. Yeah, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> just last couple of questions, really. A lot. I suppose. What was it like from the transition from South End to Orange County? Um... <laughs> paradise. Paradise. That's what it is. <laughs> I wake up every day. I say, we, 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 we can only look and see that on the movies, really, but I can imagine <laughs> that it's a nice place to live. Yeah. Do you know what, boys? Do you know what? Like, you wake up to that sun every morning, it just puts you in a completely different mind frame. And everyone's yeah. attitude, it's just, you know, everyone's happy, everyone's vibrant, everyone's got so energy. positive. Everyone's so positive. It's like, it's a different world. Like, I get up and I wake up, you know, days off, I go surfing, I go and sit on the beach, yeah. I go, you know, like, it's, it's a different li- way of living here. It's a different way of living. Um, That's amazing. And I won't, I won't ever become back to the UK, put it that way. <laughs> um, I suppose I was, that, that was my next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose that brings me on to sort of like after Orange County, because I've, I've looked at your stats and, you know, you're playing regularly for them. I think. You, yeah, I played every game last year. You know, I'm captain here. With, with, they do like a couple of captains here. They do it like just to rotate. Yeah. Um, and my future will be here. You know, my future's here and I've, you know, I've got years left ahead of me. You know, I'm physically very, very conditioned. I look after myself. Um, so yeah, listen, it'll just be a case of helping this club grow. Um, I'd like to see it, you know, go strength to strength. I'd like to see it create more players. Um, I think that the infrastructure here is obviously having a core of, you know, six, seven players who are good experience, good knowledge, good, you know, they've got boys that have played in top leagues. We've actually just signed a lad who was at Madrid and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, boys that have played in high leagues um, around the world. You know, my centre-back partner has played for the US national team in World Cups. He's played in Mexico for a massive club. So, yeah. And then just around that, build build players to, to, to go and take to Europe eventually, you know, and, and try and be that, you know, feeder club. Definitely. I suppose on what Tom was going to say about, you know, coming back to the UK, I was yeah. going to ask you, like, obviously, after football, you've got plenty of years ahead of you yet, but after football, what would you want to do? Would you want to go into coaching over there? Yeah, so, yeah I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll be going to, to what I'm kind of doing on the side now, full time. Um, there'll be sort of a lot of, a lot of scope there and, you know, that'll be kind of my transition out I was a footballer you know, I think I think every footballer will tell you you get very worried about the anxiety and the and the feeling of you know that transition like what am I going to do next because we don't have the education behind us like a lot of boys do um, you know especially here they, they 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 carry on their college and they finish off their their schooling which is great we don't have that so being somewhere where I can see um, myself you know in the future is, is it it's a comforting feeling you know it's, it's not like oh what am I going to do next you know when I was injured I went through my injury period you know, I went and got a, a mortgage broken license. I went went to the city and, and got something because I thought, you know, with my knees at the time, I thought I'd have to retire. And I was so scared that I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like, where am I gonna earn money? You know, I've been I've been used yeah. to earning a certain amount of money for X amount of years. And if that stops, I've still got free mortgages I've got to pay for. I've still got to pay for this, pay for that. Like I'm I'm shitting myself, you know. Yeah. So you know, footballers, you know, they need to really, really, you know, focus on you know, what's next? Because it's, you know, I remember being 16 years old, leaving home and it felt like yesterday, you know, so got to have that in your back pocket, you know, that's the biggest thing I say. And listen, if you're smart with your money and you invest well and da 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 then, then great. And the top boys, they don't need to worry. But boys that aren't, you know, people like me, you know, listen, I, I, I had a great career, a championship and, you know, I, could, I had good money, like I, I done well, but it's just like, it doesn't last forever. And, mm. you know, that certain lifestyle that you're maybe accustomed to a little bit. Listen, I was never flashy and anything like that, but you know, it's nice to be able to, you know, look after your parents or, you know, do this, do that. And like when that, you know, doesn't, you know, I can't do that now. It's different. It's a different stage of my life, you know. So um having that something that you can walk into is a nice feeling, I think. Definitely. And I think <clears throat> obviously it's great for you to already be kind of in that coaching setup. So, you know, it looks like there's a clear path for you to go on even after your career and going in, into coaching and helping Orange County. And obviously, it sounds like things are going really well for you over there. Yeah, so. thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I put a lot of effort into it and I, you know, I'm very, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm very driven. Uh, I think that's, I think that's, I think you'll find with a lot of footballers are very driven. They have to be, you know, you go through those experiences, you can't sit down and just let things just bypass you. You've got to go out and do it. And, I think one thing that football has taught me is to be going you know, be that hungry animal and go and make things work for yourself, you know. So hopefully whatever you take that into your next industry or your next chapter, you, you know, I think you're you know you're, you're wired up correctly, you know. Definitely. Um honestly, it's been brilliant having you on the podcast yeah. and what Definitely. an insight it's been into football in general, not just blues. 
And I think a lot of people will be interested to watch this. I'm yeah. certainly going to watch it again myself. But uh, honestly, it's been a pleasure having you on and thank you for joining us, Rob. Uh, no, 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 no. I was uh, going to ask one little favour, guys. So in the next, uh, just just for my for my you know academy here, I've got a little training video coming out for my sort of pre-season. It's been, you know, uh, kind of a bit of a weird time here. We've had about two, three, four months off. So I've just created a little video and I'm just trying to for my, you know, just trying to create a bit of exposure. So perhaps you could just share that on your story for me. Just yeah, it's perfectly yeah. fine, mate. Um, just yeah. send that over to us. We'll get it on our socials and uh, spread the word, really. Um, All right, listen, thanks so much. I hope uh, lockdown, you know, is not too tedious for you boys and um, it's been a pleasure. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having no you on. No problem, mate. Thanks for that, mate. Brilliant. Okay.